Yeah, let me introduce my wife. We're going to be celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary in April. It's my wife, Liz, and she, careful giving her the microphone. She might try to take over. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. It's a wonderful thing to be here this morning. We thank your pastors for inviting us once again. We had a short dinner last night, about three hours, <laughs> to catch up. And we, we just love the body of Christ. You know, it's all over the world. God's people are the best people on the planet. We just want more of them. Isn't that right? You know, I was thinking about how many nations do not know the Lord like the United States of America. You think about what needs to be done in this nation. So many nations are, are just so lost. But, you know, our God's a big God. He's a great God, and, and he's able to touch people everywhere. You know, before it's all over, every nation will know him and have a church in their culture. And we're, we're excited about it. We, we love traveling, don't we, Hamid? We do. We do. We're blessed. <laughs> so thank you for having us today. We love being here. Now, since the last time we were here, we've been in close to half a dozen different nations, and in four of them, just from September up till Christmas. And we've got a short little video of some pictures because... Somebody once said that one picture is worth a thousand words, so we're going to save all kinds of words today by showing you this, this video clip. And if we go ahead and run that right now, and then I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. Who 
we know, we know the story's just begun. It's not over. You said, you said, Jesus, there would be a just movement out of America. Oh, God. So we say, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, God. We're asking, we're asking for a wild missions movement. Oh, God, that every corner, every corner would be covered. Oh, God, that the gospel would go out to every nation, every tongue, and every tribe, that they all would be reached. Oh, Jesus, this is, this is our heart cry. So, oh, Now, when we were watching that, Pastor Bill leaned over and said, explain that wedding scene because we don't want people to think we're part of some Mooney organization. But see, when we do a conference, an AFCM family reunion in, on the Amazon, you know, we go upriver, we go to the places where these villages are, and these people that have gotten saved under these ministries, they were living with, you know, their partners before they ever got saved. And they need to get married, and so once they get the word in them a little bit, then they want to get married, but they want to do it in front of all of the family. And so they'll wait until we do a family reunion, and then they'll hold the, the marriage ceremony. And so Ron Thiessen, he's in charge of that whole work down there. He does individual weddings. We had 15 of them that night. And it wasn't just a group thing, no. <laughs> the group came in and then he would do one at a time with each and every, make it personal for each and every one of them. And so that's why we do that. They like to come to the family and get married. I mean, what better place to do it than at a family reunion anyway? So we, we just accommodate that. And every year there is, there's couples that get married. We had 15 of them in Santa Clotilde and Iquitos. I think we had another four of them get married. And so that, that's what that was about. Now, in, v in Vietnam, you may have noticed that, uh, let me explain just a little bit about Vietnam. It, it is a communist nation, and so everything's underground. The churches are underground. The Bible schools are underground. When we go in and teach in these underground schools, we've got to sneak in. You may have seen that picture of me with a helmet on and a face mask, and, well, that's because that's a good way to, to sneak in. The best way to get to the Bible schools on the back of a motorcycle. And when we got into this particular school, we got off the bus, and Liz and I and Pastor Nam, our main contact, we, got, we, we all put on helmets and face masks. We got on the back of three different motorcycles. We took three different routes to get to the place where the Bible school was being held so that nobody gets wise. Nobody can figure out what's going on there. When the students come, they come for one week every month. They come down to the school, and they stay there. They don't leave. They come to the school, they eat there, they sleep there, they have school there for a week, and then they go back home. This is to protect everybody so that we don't get arrested and go to jail. That's a good thing. <laughs> we don't want to go to jail. Uh, the, see, if we went to jail in Vietnam, they'd just deport us, but they'd put us on a list where we couldn't go back again. So uh, that's, they, they do most of that to protect us so that we can keep coming back. In fact, I go back in March to teach for another two weeks in two different Bible schools in Vietnam. So if you'd be praying, I'd appreciate that. Pray for our, my protection. I'm going by myself this time. Liz is staying home, gonna, gonna take some, get some home time. <laughs> We're not home much. We have a home in Butte, Montana, and we get there a couple of weeks every two or three months, something like that, and we get to go home after this. So praise God. Hey, uh, I want us to get into the Word, and then you'll hear a little bit more about what we're doing overseas as we go through the Word. And you, you can uh, actually open your Bibles to Joel chapter 2, if you would, this morning, or your, your electronic device, whatever kind of doohickey that you use, read the Word with. Uh, while you're finding that, when, when this new year turned over, I went to the Lord and asked, Lord, what, what do you want me to share in churches here in the States or, or even around the world? But Lord, what's, what's hot? What do you want shared? And you know what? He took me back to a prophecy that Brother Hagen gave years ago. In fact, he gave it and, and wrote it in one of the last books that was published before he moved off to heaven. 
And you can find it yourself if you wanted to. It's, it's in the book called Tongues Beyond the Upper Room, and it's in the last chapter of that book. And he had me go back and read it, and I'm going to read it to you. It goes like this. We have seen the wave called the healing revival. We have seen the wave called the charismatic movement. We have seen the wave of faith and of teaching of God's word. But now another wave is coming. It's the wave of the Holy Ghost. Oh yes, we've seen the power of the Holy Ghost in a limited fashion, but a wave is coming that'll bring His power on a higher level and in a far greater measure than we have ever seen heretofore. It's coming. The waves of the Holy Ghost are building higher. Don't stay on the old wave of yesterday's move. Swim out to the deep waters of the spirit realm by praying in the Holy Ghost and get on the next wave of God's purposes for this hour. Then keep on praying so that you can ride that new wave as it builds and builds in divine power and glory. Brother Hagin went on to say, I'm convinced the wave that is coming will be twice as high as the healing wave, the charismatic wave, or the faith wave. In fact, it'll be twice as high as all of them put together. I believe it's going to be the wave that sweeps us right on into the shores of the glory world. Now, Brother Hagin, before he passed on to heaven, he was having Holy Ghost meetings. And Liz and I were actually in the Holy Ghost meeting where he saw this. God gave him a vision of this wave. And later he wrote it down and put it in that book. But when God was giving him that vision of that wave, he just stood there on the platform. And you could tell he was not looking into the natural world. You could tell he was looking over into the spirit realm. And what he saw over there, he could hardly describe. In fact, he looked at it and he said, oh my, oh my, how do you describe that? How do you describe what a tree looks like to an Eskimo because he's never seen one? How do you describe what this looks like to people that have never seen it? And what he was seeing was this huge wave, this, this wave of revival, this wave of glory, this wave that was coming, this end time revival move of the Spirit of God is what he was looking at. And see, we're right on the edge of that right now. I believe it. And I believe that's why he's stirring us again. See, the United States of America needs revival. You know, there's other countries around the world that are experiencing it to a measure, but the United States needs to receive it because the United States is not done when it comes to what God has for it. This country has always been used as a springboard to take the gospel to the nations, and we're not finished with that yet. God wants this light to shine here in America because if it shines here, it'll shine all over the world. People pay attention to what's going on in America. And so we get revival here, they'll pay attention all around the world, and they'll be saying, bring it here, bring it here. Glory to God. And see, when, when we have these kind of words, when we have these prophetic words, and Brother Hagin says prophetic visions, you know, it's got to line up with the word. If it doesn't line up with the word, then don't receive it. No, it's got to go right along with the word. And I believe this one does in Joel chapter 2. Actually, there's lots of places. We're only going to look at this one. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 23, uh, prophet Joel said it this way. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain, in the first month. Now, when it comes to this rain, and if you know anything about Israel, they would have that early rain, and that would be the rain that would soften up the ground, and that would be the rain that they'd plant the, the crop into so that it could germinate and get up and get a start. And then months later, the latter rain would come, which was good, because then that crop, could, the heads could fill with grain, and they'd have a nice harvest if they had good early and latter rain. But see, Joel here is talking about this early and latter rain happening in the same month. And any time you've got that much rain happening one month, you're going to have a flood. <laughs> you're going to have a flood. You're going to have... Uh, and see, this is what Brother Hagin was looking at. He was looking at a flood. He was looking at this wave that was going to cover the earth. Now, verse 24 of Joel 2 tells us what this is for. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat. And the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of harvest. You know, any farmer will tell you that you can't have harvest unless you have rain first. And so really, this is a picture, this rain, this wave that Brother Hagin saw, this, this wave of glory, this wave of anointing, this revival is so that this end time harvest can be brought in. That's what it's all about. And not just, not just, uh, people saved, but actually people discipled. 
You know, it's not enough to cut a wheat crop and leave it out there in the field. It ain't harvest until it's brought into the barn. It's not harvest until it's actually put to use. And so you can't just go out there and get people saved and leave them. No, we're, we are called in this great commission, yes, to preach the gospel to them, yes, to get them saved, but then to go on and, and help them be disciples. To go on and plant churches in their culture so they got an opportunity to grow and reach out to other people. You know, Matthew 24, 14 says this, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. When's the end going to come? Not until this gospel has been preached in all the world to all the nations. And if you look up that word nations, you'll see that it's coming from the Greek word ethos. It's where we get our word ethnic from. And really, it's not talking about country and geographical boundaries. It's not talking about the nations that we think of. It's talking about language groups. It's talking about people groups. It's talking about tribes. And so the, Jesus is saying the end will not come until this gospel has been presented to every nation. Now, I, I get tickled sometimes when I hear ministers say, well, Jesus, come back tomorrow. Well, um, I don't think so. You want to know why? Because there's still close to 7,000 language groups, tribes, people groups that do not have a church in their own culture, and close to half of them, so about 3,500 of these tribes, have never even heard the name of Jesus even once, not one time. And so it's probably going to take longer than a day or two <laughs> for them to hear about Jesus. Probably going to take a little bit longer than what some people are saying. Now, it can happen fast, and I believe it will happen fast, especially when this wave of glory falls, when this wave envelops the earth like Brother Hagin saw. It will, it will come to pass fast. Now, James chapter 5, verse 7 says this, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? waiting patiently and for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. See, what is Jesus waiting for? Actually, what is our Father waiting for? Why doesn't he send Jesus back? Well, this is the way I look at it. Our Father God is the best farmer there ever was or ever will be. And he planted his best seed. He sowed his only begotten son into this world. And he's not calling it quits until he gets the biggest harvest he can get. He's not stopping until he can get the harvest. See, it's not an accident that there are 7,000 or, or 7 and a half billion, I'll get it right, people living on the earth right now. That's not an accident. That's on purpose. Our father's a good farmer. He's expecting a huge yield out of that population. And see, he's expecting to reap a crop out of tribes that he's not even gotten one crop out of yet. And he's not calling it quits until that happens. Now, what can we do to help with this? Is there something that we can do? And you might be thinking, well, I'm not called to go as a missionary. Well, no, but you're, you, can, you can help people go. You can send people. And the other thing you can do is you can pray. Look with me in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, and I want us to read verses 21 through 22 because prayer can actually cause the heavens to open and for God to pour out of his spirit like what he said he would do. Look at Luke chapter 3, we're going to read verses 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, everybody say, while he prayed. While he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. <laughs> Amen. While he prayed, something happened. While he prayed, the heavens opened up. While he prayed. See, a lot of times we just focused on, on what came out of heaven, and I don't know that we realize what went up first. You see, and, and, and this is not a coincidence. In fact, we're going to find a pattern in the scriptures, and we're going to look at a few of them. I'm not going to look at all of them. I, you know, we'd, if, if, we, if I was teaching in the Bible school in Vietnam, we'd stop, we'd look at all of them. <laughs> but but we're, not, we're not doing that today. You don't need to sit here for eight hours. But see, it wasn't a coincidence that the heavens opened when Jesus prayed. In fact, as we look and see this pattern, it weak. It, 
this is so important because if we can establish how God was, then we can determine how he will be. See, I am a student of revival. I like to read about past revivals. And when I see how God moved in the past, it gets me excited because if he did it then, he can do it today. If he did it back then, he's not lost the recipe. He can go ahead and do it again. And if we can establish how he was, then we can determine how he will be. And see, another one of these places is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And you can, uh, you can turn there or, or not. We're going to go pretty fast about this. See, this is when, when uh, Solomon was dedicating the temple that he built. David wanted to build it and couldn't. Solomon built it. And, and we know the story, and I've heard the story and read the story, but I hadn't really noticed what Solomon was doing before this big story happened. In 2 Chronicles sh- chapter 7, verse 1, it says this, When Solomon had finished praying. So what had he been doing? He had been praying. And then what happened? Well, then fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. What else happened? Well, the, the, the temple got so full of the glory of God that the, the priest couldn't even go through the door. You know, and I get, I get a picture of that. I get a mental image of these guys trying to go through the door, you know, and open the door and bouncing off this glory that is just so thick they can't even walk into. But see, and what was the result? Well, verse 3 tells us when the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and how the glory came into the temple, it tells us the result. What happened? They hit their faces. Man, they got on the pavement and they began to praise God. They began to say, for the Lord, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. See, this is my contention. When God pours out of his spirit, when this glory that Brother Hagin saw, when this wave that Brother Hagin saw begins to, to, to sweep this world, people are going to know that this is God. They're going to know and they're going to turn to him by the droves. See, over in, Luke, over in Luke, we saw where Jesus was praying and the dove descends and the voice comes from heaven. Here in 2 Chronicles, I mean, we got the equivalent of a church service. And when Solomon had finished praying, the fire came down. Now, if you'd have been in that service, you'd have seen it. <laughs> you'd have seen it. You'd have saw the fire come down. You'd have saw the glory fill the place. And see, this is talking about real things coming from heaven. This is not make-believe. Now, let's look at another example. Look at Acts chapter 2. You probably know this one pretty good. Acts chapter 2. Look at what it says. We're going to begin in verse 1 where it says this. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, what were they doing in that one place? Acts 1 verse 14 tells us they were having a prayer meeting. They were praying, and while they prayed, the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit came from, from above. See, something was going up, and then something began to come down. Where did it come from? Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. See, that sound didn't come from the east, it didn't come from the west, it didn't come from the south, it didn't come from the north, it came from heaven. And I want you to put yourself in their place. You're there in that upper room, you've just had a prayer meeting, and then what happens? I mean, this sound comes in like a rushing mighty wind. In fact, the Amplified says it a little bit different. The Amplified says it it was a sound like the rushing of a violent tempest blast. Now, what's that mean? Well, it came from heaven, and it was a sound that they'd never heard before. It was a sound that they really didn't have words to describe. And so they said, well, it's like a rushing mighty wind, or it's like a violent tempest blast. You know, before Oral Roberts moved to heaven, God gave him a vision of these days that we're living in right now. And in that vision, uh, 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 who did I say? Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, he not only saw, but he heard. And he described what he heard, and he said, you know, it, it was the wind of the Holy Spirit, but it, was, it sounded like a jet engine. And he, says, I'll, he said, actually, it sounded like one of those Atlas rockets blasting off from Cape Canaveral. It was so loud. It was so booming. It, it blasted so much. Well, it was like the sound of a, a violent tempest blast. Put yourself in, in, their, in their position. You're there having a prayer meeting. The Holy Spirit blows in there with this sound of an Atlas rocket. Then you look to the left and you look to the right and your neighbor's got tongues of fire sitting on their head. I mean, that might shake you up a little bit. 
<laughs> that, might just, that might just fire you up some. Amen? See, and there's going to be more of this taking place. How do we know? Well, we got God's word on it. Look what it says in, in verse 19 of Acts chapter 2. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. There's going to be more of this. You know, there's other places in Scripture where it says that, they, they, that thunder came from heaven. And when that thunder came from heaven, I don't think anybody turned to their neighbor and said, was that, was that real thunder or was that the kind that came from heaven? What kind? Of, I don't think anybody said that because they all knew it wasn't the kind, the natural thunder, that it was the stuff that came from heaven. See, there's gonna, this is going to start taking place now, I believe. This wave of the Spirit is growing and growing, and we can help with that by praying as well, by praying in the Spirit. See, I think this is why that, that the Lord is emphasizing. When Liz and I go to other countries, you know, we talked about four countries we were at uh, before Christmas. We were teaching different things in all of these different countries, except for one common thread. Every place we went, God was getting people baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Every place we went. I would, I would estimate that over a thousand people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We got to Nepal and he even changed our travel plans. We, got, we finally had a day off. And so we were, we were talking with the Lord about our next trip because we were going to go out into the village area where Liz and I lived about 25 years ago. We were praying about it and the Lord said, no, we just had this check in our hearts. Don't do it. Stop. You know, red light. I've learned over the years, if God gives you a red light, you better stop. Don't keep going. Stop. And so we then asked him, Lord, where is it that you want us to go? What is it that you want us to do? And he reminded us that we had a, a Facebook friend. <laughs> you know, we don't normally Go follow people up because they friended us on Facebook. But this guy, his name is Deepak Tamong, and Deepak had befriended us, and we'd talked to him a little bit on Facebook, and the Lord said, go visit him. We thought, wow, okay. And so we messaged him, you know, on Facebook and told him, hey, we'd like to come see. He got all excited. We took the seven-hour bus ride down to him. We were talking to him, and we discovered that he was not only, not only was he pastoring, but he was overseeing 30 churches. And that God had used him, he was instrumental in getting the church established in his own tribe, in the Tamong tribe. In fact, he'd done that so well, he even went over to the next tribe and was evangelizing the Chipong tribe. And so we got there and he said, would you come preach in my father's church? It's kind of a family affair. He's pastoring, his father's pastoring, his brother's pastoring. <laughs> Everybody's pastoring in his family, it looked like. And so, would you preach in my dad's church? And we said, sure. I said, you know, I believe the Lord wants me to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Would that be okay? You know, I always like to run that past people that I don't know. He said, well, that's really not our custom. I said, okay, but can I teach on that? He said, sure. And so <laughs> the next day we taught in his father's church on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, gave an invitation. The whole church got filled with the Holy Ghost, including Pastor Deepak and his father, the pastor of that church. Later, he's talking to me about how that, you know, he said to me, from listening to you teach about that, I can, I can see that that's an important topic. I said, yeah, <laughs> that's a foundational doctrine. See, he'd gone to seminary. He'd gone to a Presbyterian seminary in the capital of, of Nepal in Kathmandu. And he said, you know, they didn't, they didn't teach us about the Holy Spirit. Now, the good news was they didn't teach him, teach him against the Holy Spirit. And so all we had to do was show him in the Word. When he saw it in the Word for himself, he grabbed a hold of it. He received it. Now, those 30 churches are going to be receiving as well. We got to go into ground zero of the Tamang tribe where, where the church was started, that, that two-hour walk to the village. And out there, we, we preached again and ministered. And then we talked with the people out there, and we discovered that every one of them, Every one of them got, came to salvation because somebody in their family or a neighbor was healed. See, these guys had already embraced healing. They already knew that it was God's will for healing. They just didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And so now you hook that up with the power of the Holy Ghost. And, and what, what so impressed me about Pastor Deepak is that he's got it in his heart to reach the rest of the tribes. 
This is what I like, you know. It's not about us as American missionaries going to every tribe that's out there. It's about us firing the people up that are close to those tribes and they can go out there and do it. And they can do it so much better than I can. They can do it because they know the language, they know the culture. Our job is to go give them some training, give them what they need. They'll go take it to these other tribes. See, in Nepal, there's 250 tribes and only 10 of them have been reached. Well, two of them have been reached by this guy. <laughs> and he's saying, I'll go reach the rest, you know. We're going, glory to God. I think we need to go and put a Bible school in that country. Get these guys trained up. The ITC would be perfect. Just got to get it in Nepali. Amen. <laughs> glory to God. And so, we could stop and we could look at a lot of other places in the Scripture about this pattern. They prayed and then God answered. They prayed and the heavens were opened. You know, we've seen how sounds and fire and glory and power and the Holy Spirit have come from heaven as people prayed. You know, another one that uh, I'll just refer to, we won't look it up. But in, uh, in 1 Kings 18, you got, the, you got the, uh, Elijah challenging the prophets of Baal. Remember that one? <laughs> one of my favorite stories. But I hadn't really noticed before that there's two verses in that story. Before the fire of God fell and consumed that sacrifice and the rocks and licked up the water out of the trench, you know the story, right? Before that happened, there's two verses describing how Elijah prayed and how he decreed and declared before the fire of God fell. And then what happened? Well, then the people of Israel, 1 Kings 18, 39 says, Now when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And see, that's what's going to happen again. God's going to move in these, in these powerful ways, and people are going to know who it is. They're going to know who it is. They're going to know where it came from, and then they're going to have to make a decision. See, we've seen how sounds and fire and glory and power and the Holy Spirit have come from heaven as people prayed. But you know, there's another place where this power and this anointing and this glory is going to come from, and we need to grab a hold of it as well. Do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 38? Let me remind you. <laughs> Jesus said this, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he was referring to the Holy Spirit. See, we know that the Holy Spirit lives in believers. We know that the Holy Spirit comes upon believers in power. And we know we've had a lot of teaching about how this anointing needs to come out of us to set people free. Lots of that. We know that through the years there's been men and women of God that have had a powerful river of anointing flowing out of them. Men like John G. Lake and, and Smith Wigglesworth and Kenneth E. Hagan and, and women like Maria Woodworth Etter and Amy Simple McPherson as well as Catherine Coleman. God used them. There was a powerful river of anointing that flowed out of them. And why am I bringing that up right now? Because there's two places this power, this glory is really going to need to come from. Power poured out from heaven and power also coming out of the innermost being of believers all over this planet. God's getting people full of the Holy Ghost all over the world so that they can pray, so that they can pray and help build this spirit of revival that's coming and then to pray and ride that revival all the way into harvest time. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 24 and we'll begin to wrap this up real quick. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, this is a prophetic scripture. You know I've already quoted from it in uh, verse 14 about how the end's not coming until the gospel is preached to all the nations. Well, in, in verse 37 of Matthew chapter 24, it says this, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, we can keep reading. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, when I've read this in the past, I've always just looked at it and went, well, how was it in Noah's day? Because it's going to be that way when Jesus comes back, according to what we just read. How was it in Noah's day? And I've always, in the past, just thought about how that sin was just running rampant. And how sin and iniquity had gotten so full that God had to do something. He couldn't just let it go on any longer. And he did do something. What did he do? He poured out his wrath. He flooded the earth and wiped out everybody except for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. 
Noah and his bunch, eight people, the only ones that God saw fit, the only ones that he thought were righteous, and so he, he saved them. See, the, the, the saving of Noah and his family is an ark, in the ark is a type and a shadow of the time that we're living in today. See, today the church, the born-again crowd, that's us. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because of what Jesus did, we have this right standing and we too will be saved from the wrath that is to come. See, God's not going to put up with sin and iniquity forever. There, he is going to pour out his wrath. You can read about it in the end of the book. He is going to pour out his wrath, but he's going to protect his body. He's going to protect his kids. He's going to protect the righteous one, just like he did with Noah and his bunch. See, Noah and the ark is a type and a shadow of the church and the rapture. Now, we're not going to stop and look at all the, the rapture scriptures. There's a bunch of them. You can read about them in 1 Corinthians 15. You can read about it in 1 Thessalonians. You know, all of that's about it. It, it talks about the catching away of the church. Some people say, well, the rapture, that's not even in the, in the Bible. Well, catching away sure is. <laughs> We're going to be caught up. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. You know, if you look that up in the, in the, in the dictionaries and uh, uh, look it up, you'll see that it actually means snatched. It says snatched by forceful seizure. I like that. Some people say, well, that rapture doctrine, that's just an escape doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Noah and his family escaped on that ark, we're going to escape in, in, in the rapture. And see, I was thinking about this. In Noah's day, before God poured out his wrath, what did he have happen? Well, he had, he had Noah build an ark, and then he had animals come to that ark, two of every species loaded into that ark. Seven of all the clean species of animals were loaded into that ark. Well, now, let's think type and shadow just a little bit. Because when, when God revealed this to me, I just got all excited. Do you think type and shadow? The ark is actually a type of the church. And so here we are building the church. And before he pours out his wrath, before there, there's going to be this flood, before that takes place, he's going to want people from every tongue, every tribe, Every people group. You know, I know that God likes animals and he loves animals, but that was a type for now. And the type and shadow that we see now is he's wanting people from every tongue, every tribe, every language group, every people group. He wants them in the church before the wrath gets poured out. He wants this ark to be full before the rapture takes place. See, the end's not coming until this takes place. You know, there are some people who say, well, they can come in during the tribulation time. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Jesus told us to go make disciples. And if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that there's going to be people from every nation, every tongue, every tribe around the throne of God giving praise and worship. So obviously they make it. <laughs> Got to get in the ark, though. Amen. Well, I've got just a few more minutes. I'm going to wrap this up. From, from Genesis... See, we're looking at types and shadows now of Noah and in his day. And some of them are pretty easy to see. When God revealed that one to me, I'd never heard that one before. And when he revealed it to me, I, I stood up and shouted and ran around my desk a few times, got all excited. Because I'm always looking for, uh, that's my heart, that's my wife's heart, is to get these tribes in. To get these people that have never even heard once. Let's, let's let them hear. Let's do what we can to get them in. And from these types and shadows, see, we know there was a flood in Noah's day. Well, there's going to be a flood in our day as well. Now, in Genesis chapter 9, we know that after the flood, God said he would never flood the earth again with water. But in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 9 and Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, God said the whole earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory as the waters cover the sea. Now, let me ask you, how well does water cover the sea? Um, completely. <laughs> and so this is telling us that the knowledge of the glory, not just the glory. See, sometimes people quote that and they kind of quote it not quite accurately. It'll be the knowledge of the glory, which I say is a better thing because when this glory happens, everybody's going to have a knowledge of it and they're going to know where it came from and they're going to know what it's about. In fact, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5 says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. 
There's going to be another flood, but this time it's not going to be a water. It's going to be of the glory. It's going to be this huge wave of the Spirit that Brother Hagin saw before he moved on to, to heaven. And it's not just going to come out of heaven. It's also going to come out of every believer that will go ahead and yield themselves to God. You know, I, for, for these last few minutes, I want you to picture in your mind a flood. See, if there was a flood that came into this earth today, if there was a flood that came into this town today, boy, it'd have to be a big one to get this place all wet because, you know, you got all these hills and valleys and, and stuff around here. But picture a huge flood. If it was big enough, everything would get wet. Now, sometimes you, you, you hear about floods in the news, and, and what are they doing? Well, they're building dikes, and they're sandbagging, and they're going to keep the water out. But again, if that flood's big enough, it's going to get everything wet. See, there are groups of people today, like far-left liberals and atheists and humanists and all those people that belong to isms, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islamism, all those people, they think that this Christian God stuff's never going to touch them. I got some news for them. God is going to burst in on them like a flood, and when He does... They're going to know that this came from God, this came from heaven. They're going to know who sent it. They're going to know what it's about. And then there's going to be multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision needing to make a choice. I believe most of them will come on in. I know there's going to be a, a, a bunch of them that are just going to hold their hand up. And, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Not that Christian God stuff. You know, do you ever wonder about that? How can somebody in the midst of the presence of God, how can they still resist? Well, you know, there's scripture that talks about how Noah's, or not Noah, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Do you ever think about that? In fact, it says that God hardened his heart. And I used to wonder about that and look at it. And, and, but Brother Hagin explained it this way. He said, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. And so if somebody won't, they just won't, well, they'll get harder and harder. See, that's, that's, how, that's how this scripture that talks about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, that, it, it was still his choice. Pharaoh chose to get hard, and then he just got harder. There's going to be people in these last days do the same thing. I think a lot of them are going to come in. See, Jesus said it would be like the days of, of Noah. Now, let's go back to types and shadows for just a minute here. Types and shadows. When it came to that flood that happened in Noah's day, you can read about it in Genesis chapter 7. It tells us that the flood came from two places. Where did it come from? Well, the windows of heaven were opened up and it came down. And the fountains of the deep were broken up. And it came up. Well, this flood that's happening in our day, this wave that Brother Hagin saw, this flood of glory that is coming, it's going to come down because God is going to pour out of His Spirit from heaven. We know that. But it's also going to come out of the hearts of believers. It, he's, going to, he's breaking up the fountains of the deep right now. He's shaking some things in this nation right now. And let me tell you, if He can shake the foundations of the government, He can certainly shake the foundations of the church. God is wanting to revive this nation. Revival starts in the church. I mean, you've got to be vived before you can be revived. <laughs> You're not going to have revival without, without viving. <laughs> the people that are saved need to be revived. They need to be woken up. There is a great awakening going on right now. God is shaking things, waking people up to do what? To be involved with this end time harvest. To go ahead and let their fountains be broke up so they too can have rivers of living water flowing out of their innermost being. And I'm telling you, when this water that's flowing out of the hearts of believers meets up with the water that's being poured out from heaven, it's going to be a flood. A flood of glory. The knowledge of the glory of God's going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Everybody's going to know what it is. Everybody's going to know where it came from. And there's going to be multitudes in the valley of decision. 
And so today, my challenge to all of us is, are we ready to have our fountains broken up? Are we ready to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues? And are we ready to go ahead and work with that? Are we ready to pray in the Spirit the way God wants us to pray? As we pray in the Spirit, we're, we're getting out there to that big wave, and then we can ride that wave as we continue to pray in the Spirit. And what's that wave about? That wave is about the plans and purposes of God for right here and right Right now, he's wanting to harvest. <laughs> That's what it's about. And he's wanting to use you and me. And see, even if you've been praying in other tongues, you know you can go further with that. Here's what Liz and I have seen as we've traveled the, the world. We've seen God free people up. Yeah, they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. They're speaking in other tongues, and God gave them another language. Why is he giving other languages? He's wanting people to pray things that he wants to pray. See, he wants us to pray our lists. You know, you can have your prayer list, your prayer concerns. And you, that's good to pray that list, but that takes, what, five, ten minutes? Then what? Then he's wanting us to pray in the Spirit. He'll actually give you a language to pray for a tribe overseas. Do you know that? If we'll yield to him. When I was, we were down in the Amazon. Ron Thiessen down there, he's, he grew up on the Amazon. He was a child of Wycliffe Bible translators, and they were translating the Bible for the Bora Indians on the Amazon. And when we were down there in Iquitos, the Bora Indians were coming to Ron. Ron speaks fluent Bora, Spanish, and English. And so here's these guys speaking to, to Ron in, in Bora, just chattering away in Bora. I listened to that, and I thought, I've heard that before. I've heard that language Can I come out of my own mouth. I don't know what it was, what it, I, I couldn't understand it, but that's what, that's what tongues is about. God wanting to pray things that he wants to be prayed through you if we'll go ahead and yield to that. Amen. So here's, here's what I'm saying. God can break up the fountains of the deep on the inside of you, and you can be used more effectively in prayer. You can be used more effectively, and that's what's needed right now. Right now for this revival to come, like what we're believing for, well, people need to pray. Just like the pattern we saw, when people prayed, then the heavens opened up. Well, the more we pray, the more the fountains of the deep are broken up as well. The more we pray, the, the more we practice the praying in the Spirit, the more it comes. And then what? Well, then God does what He wants done. The purposes and plans of God get prayed out. Most of the time when you're praying in other tongues, you're playing, praying out the plans and purposes of God. For your life, but then for the lives of those that are around you. You know, God's not satisfied with the amount of people that have been reached in, in Missouri. He's not satisfied. <laughs> He's the best farmer ever. He's wanting the biggest yield he can get. <laughs> He's not satisfied. Well, what, what's it going to take? Well, we can pray more. We can reach more. We can allow these rivers to flow out of us. You know, one river is a lot of water, but the scripture says rivers of living water flowing out of the innermost being. God's wanting to use us to pray in the Spirit, and then He's wanting to use us to go out there and set people free. The purpose of the anointing is to set people free. The purpose of the anointing is to bring this harvest in. Praise the Lord. And so my challenge for all of us today is just to yield to God more. Let Him shake you. Let him break up the fountains of the deep more. Let those languages come out of you. Let, that, let your heart pray the way that God wants you to pray. And you'll be amazed at the difference it'll make. You'll have opportunities to, to minister to people. You'll have opportunities to witness to people. You'll have opportunities. Things will go better when you're praying in the Holy Ghost more. The more you hook up with God's purpose and plans, the better it'll get. <laughs>